Well, frankly, it's, uh, it's great to see everybody here today. Thanks for uh, wanting to be with God's people today. Thanks for uh, wanting to worship our great God, to hear God's word opened up. Just think about that for a second. The uh, God of the universe wants to meet with some people from League City, Texas today. Wants to speak into their hearts. That's a great thought. Um, he can even work a miracle and get his ideas into our head which is a fantastic thought. So today we're going to begin this uh, six-week series. It's called Explorations in Genesis. We're going to be examining perhaps some of the more troubling passages related to creation. I have um, privately longed to preach this series for quite a while, um, and I never felt the call to preach it. Uh, but many of you know my undergraduate degree was in uh, biology. It was actually in an emphasis in genetics and evolution. I had the opportunity to study under a man named Dr. Theodius Dobyshansky. Um, he came to the school where I was. He's called the father of American genetics. And so uh, neither Dr. Dobyshansky or I were Christians at the time. Um, I was the one that became a Christian. He didn't. Um, and that was at the University of Redlands in Southern California. Uh, they had a little program where they bought a genius for a semester, and he happened to be uh, the genius. They put him in residence. He ate with us, uh, slept in the same dorms, and uh, because I was a biology major, he was in most of my classes, and we got to pal around with him afterwards. And frankly, I got to ask him all the questions that all of you would ask. And so that was probably the single greatest... Uh, event in my life which caused me not to become an evolutionist. Um, and he was a man of integrity. And so where we would hit holes in his thinking, he would say, you're right. You're right. Takes a lot of faith to believe that. Uh, so we're going to start out by reviewing chapter one. I will go ahead and read that. And uh, for a week or so, we'll be reviewing chapter one because there's a lot of great stuff in there. Then we'll go ahead and pick up a little more speed. But I'm approaching this uh, topic not from an evolutionary side, but as a creationist. And I'll try to win all of you over to the light side from the dark side. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, I pray that your word would uh, be clear to us, that as we would uh, hear me read it, it would be as if it's coming from your voice, which is the one that has the knowledge behind it. So as always, Lord, we pray that you would use your word to be the change agent in our lives, because your word is what doesn't change. Our culture certainly does change rapidly and poorly, uh, but we know, Lord, that your truth has never changed. It's transcultural, transgenerational truth. So guide our time now, Lord, and may it all be to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go ahead and uh, begin here. In the beginning, God. And that is the greatest opening of any book ever. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So the text begins in Hebrew, Bereshith bara Elohim, in the beginning, God. And that is so powerful. There couldn't be any other way to begin the details of creation itself without just that beginning. In the beginning, God. God what? God is. God was. God always was. God. He was the only one. And all creation and all matter proceeds from him and him alone. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of the God was hovering over the face of the waters. You notice also that the earth wasn't much to brag about. 
at this early stage, probably it's still submerged. It's interesting that someone else was present as well. And who was that? The Holy Spirit, thank you. <laughs> no, you got to read the text. See, right there in verse 3, it's the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the Holy Spirit was there. Incidentally, the entire Trinity was there. Uh, if you recall, in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, uh, verse 15, Paul said, uh, Jesus is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created. Understand? By him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So all creation coheres because of Jesus. Jesus is the glue that keeps our universe together. And he was present along with the Holy Spirit, along with the Father at creation itself. There's a lot more in there and we'll go ahead and revisit that as weeks go by. Let's proceed on though. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. So everything that happened up to that point is the first day. So that's it for the first day. Did anyone see a billion year gap in there somewhere? No, you didn't. In the first five verses, nobody saw a couple of billion years in there? Place to kind of sneak that in there? Anybody see billions upon billions of years? No, I don't think so. Uh, Carl Sagan, he, he saw billions and billions of years. Um, I was in university at a critical time in this thinking. Because in my little textbooks, it was about 25,000 years, the age of the earth, when I started college. 25,000 years. And then the mathematicians entered evolutionary science, and they said, well, what you're describing, that tiny adaptation that occurred there, say, in the Galapagos Islands with those finches, that tiny adaptation... That took so long, and it didn't bring another species along. It just changed the thickness of the beak. Now, if the case is that that finch has got to result in another finch, that's going to take a long time. And that moved from 25,000 to about 100,000, 125,000, more mathematicians, to millions, more mathematicians, to billions. Billions. Why, why do we have to have a gap of billions of years? Because we don't have any proof. That's a problem. That was one day, and what happened there was light was separated from darkness. Day and night were established, and so was time. So what comes next? Well, you can guess. We've got to do something with that land over there that's still submerged. And God said, and did you notice... Oh, let me just stop there and, and ask a question. Did you notice how God was doing all this? Um, was he doing it with his hands? Did he have a toolbox with him? Did he roll out the toolbox and, and hammer stuff together or saw stuff together? He didn't do any of that. We are told that he spoke it into existence. Now, as I'm talking about this, are you getting the impression that God is in a different category than man? Okay, now, now this is not conceded. 
in evolutionary thought. The supernatural is not conceded in evolutionary thought. So therefore it's eliminated and not part of the conversation at all. Verse 6 says, And God said, Let there be an expanse. God spoke that into existence. Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And so what's happening is there are, there are separate layers that are occurring. Some water is being left below. Some water is being raised up high. And in the middle is what's called heavens. God's commanding the waters to relocate. He shifts them high and low, and he creates an expanse right in the middle, which is really our sky. So, so what's above that? Well, it was a lot better then. Uh, God had a canopy to protect everybody below, everything below. God had a canopy unlike our canopy today, God had a canopy where no bad UV light was getting through. Not any. There were no cancers. No bad rays got through that canopy. So things grew at an unusually fast rate, and nothing died. That was the second day. Verse 9 says, And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. So we're going to swoop the waters together, and bingo, raise the earth from there. And God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God said that it was good. And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. And incidentally, right there is the answer to the riddle, which came first, the chicken or the egg. No, 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 it's there. He tells us he put a plant there and the plant bore the seed. Which, if you hadn't figured that out, is a supernatural act. Okay, that's a supernatural act because of something. God made a mature plant in one second. He made something that actually looks mature. Everybody thinks it's mature. If it was a tree, it could have as many annual rings in it as you want to have in it. But it was only one second old. I'm sorry, but for the creation of everything that we know, we need something supernatural. And we need to concede that supernatural means beyond the natural. We cannot lock him in our box. Verse 12 says, The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, Now, that's very difficult to do. Peg and I have had several fruit trees, but we rarely get fruit the first year. It's got to kind of mature. Maybe it needs to get fertilized by other orange trees or lemon trees or avocado trees or whatever it is. But these bore fruit the first year. And God saw that it was good. Now, I'm going to start underlining according to their own kind. Uh, Because that's what evolution is attacking. And so you'll see that these plants were made, other things were made after their own kind. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now before we had light and dark, but we didn't have a big ball up there or one in the evening. And so 
we now have a son. And you have to have a son, incidentally. This is, I picked this up because I was a biology major. Some of you may have missed that. But you need to have a son to grow plants. Now just think with me, because I'm going to say something that's kind of funny. If billions and billions of years are between each of these days, then God made a plant, but surely it's going to die because it doesn't have any sun for a billion years. Isn't that right? I remember um, about 10 years ago, Peg and I were really impressed because the town of League City was landscaping the medians in front of uh, Clear Creek High School. And they just did a bang up job. They, uh, they laid out some grass there and they had some small shrubs down there and they put some big, pine, uh, big palm trees in there. It just looked great. And as we went by, it just kept looking worse and worse. And, uh, you know, it lasted maybe two or three months. And I said to Peg, I said, did you see them put a sprinkler system in there? She said, no, I don't think they did. <laughs> it died, right? It, they died. Uh, God, God got it in the right order. But these billions people don't seem to get it in the right order. So why did they die? No water. Did I mention that it wasn't raining yet? Did I mention that? Well, how, how silly would it be for God to have planted plants and not provided a sun? Even theistic evolutionists, and a theistic evolutionist, to my mind, is an evolutionist. Uh, that's somebody who thinks, who thinks they can have a God and believe in evolution. And it's not possible. I'm sorry, it's not. Those plants at Clear Creek High School, they didn't even make it to opening day of school. They just, they didn't have a chance. Well, let's push on. Verse 15 says, And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. You know, you can navigate by those celestial bodies. Um, there are 57 navigational stars where you can have a sextant, you can shoot the star from the angle. If you get three of them, you can tell where you are on the face of the earth. You can do that with the sun, although it's a little less accurate because it's closer. You can do it with planets as well, but sometimes you don't see as many. So those things don't change. They just, they just don't change. And remember, it's Jesus who allows that all to cohere. To rule over the day and over the night, to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures. And let the birds fly above the earth, across the expanse of the heavens. So incidentally, Hebrew is a very, um, it's an emotional type of language. It's got a lot of verve in it. And so um, the, the words, there's a noun, and then there's also like a participle that goes with it. And so what that sounds like is, it's not, and let the birds be birding. Let the birds be doing what birds do. Uh, let the Holy Spirit hovering hover. That's, that's kind of the, the, the motion that's behind it. Um, again, I've highlighted according to their kind because evolution postulates that different kinds come from dissimilar kinds. And we just don't have any evidence of that. Now, I don't mind, as a creationist, asking for evidence. For instance, we should have some kind of fossils. If those things really existed, we should have some kind of fossils, but we don't. Uh, it's a myth. If I wait a million billion years, uh, you and I, we are never going to see a duck ever mature into a porpoise. That's not going to happen. Even though they are both water animals, they are different kinds. Kinds. 
And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kind, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So no snake ever became a leopard, ever became a mongoose. They produced after their own kind. Now, does that mean that I couldn't have like a yellow snake and a blue snake and a gray snake? No, that's okay. That's their kind. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And here, of course, there's this um, clear thought that God is doing something reasonably radical. Uh, God is uh, creating man in his own image, and he is giving him stewardship over the animals, over the earth. And this is a key phrase, um, and you know that it's a key phrase because it's in Latin. That says imago dei, the image of God. Now, why do evolutionists think that man is at the top of the chain? Because they're men. Why do Christians think that man is at the top of the chain? Because God told us that we were made in his image and in his likeness, and we had a job to work the earth and to be stewards of the earth that he was giving to us. But then it also says, and he made them male and female. And God bless them. And you, you, of course, notice that the parameters of God's creation only allow for male and female. When we are attacked these days by homosexuals or transgender individuals or queer people or whatever, the issue here to us is, will you change the truth of your Bible to accommodate us? It's not that we can't love the people. We do. It's not that we can't get along with the people. We can. But we cannot back away from God's word and say that what they're saying about their lifestyle is acceptable. It's not. It's just not. So we simply can't give up God's word for their truth. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that's on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Well, Jan, does this mean that everybody on the earth was a vegan at this time? Probably does. Probably does. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it, it was all very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So now we've gone through the first chapter and let's ask what we just observed, what we just saw. And so if you want to look at the back of your outline there and you can fill in these blanks, I'm sure that everybody will go home with lots of filled in blanks and they'll be happy. Uh, so what can be observed at first glance? Well, all creation begins with a creator. All creation begins with a creator. It, that's self-explanatory. Uh, when uh, my youngest son was three years old, somebody was explaining the Big Bang theory to him. Now, I'm not opposed to the Big Bang theory, incidentally. 
Uh, but what, what does it really have that they need to have? And they said, basically, you need to have a pool of amino acids. You need to have some kind of macromolecule, and then you apply energy to it. They postulated in the form of lightning. So you and I, we can sit around and we can say, I wonder how this um, cereal bowl of macromolecules ended up floating around the universe when there were no planets anywhere. And then besides that, who provided the lightning? My three-year-old said that. Dad, where'd the lightning come from? All creation begins with a creator, not a... Uh, not a pool of macromolecules. And then only a supernatural creator addresses the problem of an ex nihilo creation. Ex nihilo, again, you, you've got to get these Latin words down. They're just, they're just great. If you learn five or six of these Latin terms, you can go to any cocktail party. <laughs> ex nihilo means from nothing, from nothingness. And so, yeah, you need a supernatural creator if he is just going to show up one day and produce matter. If he's just going to show up and speak matter into existence in a coordinated fashion. And then thirdly, let's remember the Holy Spirit was also present at creation, as was Jesus. So, we say there are three persons. One essence, three persons. Romans uh, 4.17 says, God calls into existence the things that do not exist. That's said so carefully, so well. It, it, it wasn't he gave life to a dead body. That's not what this says. Romans 4.17 says he calls into existence the things that don't exist. I don't know why humans want to dumb down creation to try to explain it humanistically. It's supernatural. A fourth point. A gap of a billion years does not appear natural here. We just read through areas in chapter 1 where people throw in billions and billions of years to accommodate their ideas. And I just read it to you, and I'm willing to guess that none of you said, oh, I think I put a billion years right in there. And then lastly, day one resulted in a couple things. Light, dark, day, night, time. All those things occurred just during day one. So let's, let's say, okay, what can we take away from this? This was a, a spiffy little uh, science lesson here. Let's see what we can take away from this. Well, first is, if you're going to allow for the supernatural, then you really need to ask yourself, is this a good God or a bad God? Am, am I addressing a good God or a bad God here? Is it, is it valuable for me to perceive this individual as a good God or a bad God? If it's a good God, fine, you can keep going on. If it's a bad God, you're in deep trouble. You're just in deep trouble. He's smarter than you, stronger than you, and you're going down. All right, but if he's a good God, what kind of a good God is he? And from what we learned here, is he omniscient? Is he omnipotent? Is he all-powerful? That's what we learned. Yeah, we have to concede that to whoever formed this, whoever keeps it together. Got to be omnipotent. Got to be omniscient, all-knowing. How about this one, sovereign? Of course, it wasn't your idea. It was his idea, and he just did it. Of course, he's got to be sovereign. He, he didn't call me up and ask for my help. He didn't. He did it all by himself. He makes the rules. All of us sit down and we say, well, we don't like that. It's his earth, his air, his water. We giving God gave us everything we see and know. 
everything. Did he have to? No, no, no. Well, ask another question then. What can we take away? What else has he told me about himself through his creation? You could go on for days. Just take some time this afternoon and think about that. What else has he told us about himself through his creation? He's a pretty good provider. Pretty good project manager. He's really good with colors. He may even have a sense of humor. Some of the animals he created. Yeah. He's a genius. I mean, how do you get the sun to be captured uh, in, a, in a blade of grass that gets activated chlorophyll that somehow when a cow comes along, the energy from the sun is transmitted to the cow and when we eat a steak, we get the energy. That's pretty good. How about the third one? Just ask yourself to... Just spend some time this afternoon. What else does the presence of God tell each human being? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, this is where the evolutionists are coming from. This is the big hurdle. This is the big blockade here. Because if I allow that there's a God, and he has these attributes and more, there's a standard. And I don't like being told what to do. I'm a rebel at heart. I'm born with a sin nature. And so if I allow for the presence of God, then I know I have to answer to God. And I will fight with everything I have to stop doing that. Amen? Well, if you would, allow me to close us in prayer, and then we'll be able to celebrate the Lord's table. Lord, I pray that you'd take um, the crumbs that we've put out before and somehow make a meal of it, Lord. Uh, Lord, uh, I pray that as we would go outside later today, that you'd open our eyes to see you all around us, surrounding us with, with just your general revelation nature itself but then when we find out that you sent a savior to pay a price for our sinfulness we're awestruck we're absolutely incredulous to think that you can love us so much as to send your most cherished possession in your son to die for our sins so that we could spend eternity with you in heaven. That's called grace, something we receive that we can neither earn nor deserve. God's riches at Christ's expense. Father, I pray there's not a day that goes by that we don't live out our lives in gratitude because of all that you've done for us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.